Patrick from AI Tutor, and we've got another past paper walkthrough. So I'm going to do Ed Excel June 2018 paper two. So it's another pure mathematics paper. Cool. So let's not waste any time. Let's just see how this one goes. So question one says g of x equals 2x plus 5 over x minus 3. Find g g of 5. What does g g of 5 mean? Something that I really like to do is the following. Put a bracket, you can make it a square bracket, circular bracket, whatever, around this g of 5 on the right. Because now what this really highlights is the following. It's saying I've got this g function and the thing I'm putting into it, you know, instead of the x, is just g of 5. So what that tells us is that we kind of want to work from the right, don't we? Because if I just work out what g of 5 is, I can then just inject that into the, the g on the left and then we get our answer. So I'm going to show you how that works. So g of 5, I'm just going to sub in 5 as x. So this is going to be 2 times 5 plus 5 all over 5 minus 3. Okay, so 2 times 5 is 10. Add another 5, that's 15. So that's going to be 15 on the top. 5 minus 3 is 2 on the bottom. So what I can now do is say that g of g of 5 is therefore g of 15 over 2. So at this point, it's just normal, isn't it? Now we just do it again. We sub in x as 15 over 2 and we get our answer. So what's this going to be? This is going to be 2 lots of 15 over 2 plus 5 all over 15 over 2 minus 3. Straight to the calculator and we get what? 2 times 15 over 2 plus 5 all over 15 over 2 minus 3. And that is going to get me 40 over 9. Cool. That's A. Okay, part B says, state the range of G. So, one marker, but there's actually probably a bit more than a mark's worth of stuff to do here. So, the range of G is essentially the different values that G can take, okay? So, like, for example, if we were to have, you know, Y equals G of X and kind of plot it, the range would just be the Y values that this sits between. So, it says that X is defined for values greater than or equal to 5. So, that's kind of going to be our starting point, isn't it? If we were to just sub in x equals 5, we're going to say, okay, well, it starts here. We've actually already subbed in x equals 5, though, haven't we? We got it to be 15 over 2. So we know that 15 over 2 is going to be in some way relevant here, okay? It's either going to be, you know, the bottom value, the top value, or something in between. So what else is going on here? If we were to kind of have a think of this. So at x equals 5, we know this thing is 15 over 2. And then x is defined for all of these values kind of over here. So it starts at 5 and then essentially goes up to infinity, doesn't it? So why don't we just see what happens as x gets close to infinity? So there's a couple of ways we could do this. I mean, I could just grab my calculator, stick some really high numbers in for x. But I think we should probably be a bit more methodical. So let's kind of have a think. If y equals 2x plus 5 divided by x minus 3, a couple of different ways that I can kind of work out the long-term behavior here. So the first one is I could look at kind of the dominant terms in this fraction as x gets massive. So take the top, for example. I've got 2 times x, and imagine x is a billion, okay? So I've got 2 times a billion, and then I'm adding this 5. Which one of these terms is the term that's really providing the kind of bulk of this here? It's this 2x, isn't it? Essentially, this 2x is pretty much the whole thing, and then adding this 5 isn't really going to change the value of it that much. Imagine 2 billion, and then I add 5 on the end. Similar thing here, right? Imagine if I have a billion, and then I take 3 away from it. What's going to be the thing that really matters? It's this billion, okay? And that's only going to get what is it goes to a billion, billion, more than that. All that's going to happen is that the, this 5 and this 3, they're really not going to do much. So essentially, 2x plus 5... As x gets massive, you're kind of just going to go towards 2x. Same thing here, x minus 3, as x goes, you know, to infinity, kind of just going to go towards x, isn't it? So then I say, well, okay, as x goes to infinity, it goes to 2x over x. Well, that's just equal to 2, isn't it? So if that's a bit confusing, there is another way that we can do this. If we divide everything by x, that really shows us kind of what the dominant terms are. And I'll show you why. So 2x over x is going to be 2, and then plus 5 over x on the top. And then again, 
x over x is going to be 1, and then I'm going to get minus 3 over x. So this might be an easier way for you to kind of understand it, because I say, well, okay, as x goes to infinity, look at this, these two terms are going to go to 0, aren't they? So we're just going to be left with 2 over 1, which equals 2. A couple of different ways of just showing you why that is, but essentially what we have shown is that it goes towards y equals 2. That's going to be an asymptote, isn't it? So then, essentially, well, it starts here at 15 over 2, okay? And then it's going to go down, kind of like this, to have an asymptote of y equals 2. So there is something that I kind of want you to at least be aware of here. We've not technically proved, almost, that, that it's between these two values, because who are we to say that it doesn't actually go up above 15 over 2 and then down towards 2? Then it wouldn't be constrained within these two values, would it? So I suppose you're going to really just want to at least have a bit of an understanding about what this graph looks like. So the almost base graph at play here is the graph of y equals 1 over x, like a general reciprocal graph. And essentially what happens is you have these different kind of chunks of it. You have a vertical asymptote, of which it's kind of going to be discontinuous, it's going to jump. But then if you actually zone in on a single chunk, as we do here, it's only either decreasing or increasing, isn't it? Meaning that if it starts at 15 over 2 and ends at 2, it's not going to jump in between there, it's going to just go all the way down. So essentially, y here, is going to be, well, we know it can equal 15 over 2, because it does when x equals 5. So it's going to be less than or equal to 15 over 2. But then the 2 is just an asymptote, so it never quite hits it. So it gets really, really close to it, so it's just going to be greater than it. So that's going to be the range here, and I quite a lot of one mark, I know. <laughs> so C says the following. Find g to the minus 1 of x, stating its domain. So what is g to the minus 1 of x? Well, it's the inverse function. So essentially, g of x is saying, right, look, take an x value, put it into this g of x, and then you get a y value. So the inverse is basically saying, well, I got this y value. What was the x value that you asked for, essentially? So essentially, it's taking this equation y equals 2x plus 5, x minus 3, which, you know, I put an x value in and I get a y value. And then basically rearranging it. If we just rearrange this, then to get x in terms of y, then it's like, okay, well, I got this y value. What was the x value that you put into it? So I'm just going to rearrange this. So I'm going to times 3 by x minus 3 to get y x minus 3 equals 2x plus 5. Multiply out. We're used to this stuff to get xy minus 3y equals 2x plus 5. I'm going to turn my x's to the left here, take everything else to the right. So I'm going to get xy minus 2x equals, add this, 3y plus 5. So take out an x as a common factor to get x times y minus 2 equals 3y plus 5, and then divide. So x is going to equal 3y plus 5 divided by y minus 2 here. So because we want this kind of as a function of x, look, it says g to the minus 1 of x, we're just going to swap this with an x at this point. So I'm going to say, therefore, g to the minus 1 of x is going to equal 3x plus 5 divided by x minus 2. One more thing, it says stating its domain. Notice the word state, it doesn't say calculate or anything, so we're just going to, we're going to know this. And that is because we know what the range of g is. And if you think about it, the range is the different y values it can be, domain is the different x values. But going from g to the inverse of g, what we're doing, we're just swapping the x and the y, meaning that the range of g is just going to be the domain of the inverse. So straight away, well, I just worked out the range of g in part b, which I got, you know, y is between 2 and 15 over 2. But now I'm just swapping it to an x. So in other words, the domain of this thing is going to be that. Moving on to question 2. Relative to a fixed origin O, the point A has vector 2i plus 3j minus 4k, B has vector 4i minus 2j plus 3k, and C has vector ai plus 5j minus 2k, where a is constant and less than zero. These are the points such that ab equals bd. Find the position vector of d. Okay, so all we really need to know is what this little equation they've given us actually represents. So it says AB, and that is the vector that takes me from A to B. So then we ask ourselves, well, how do we work that out? It's actually relatively simple. All we need to do is we need to take the position vector of B and then take away 
the position vector of a. So if we just quickly work that out, we can then get that into our equation. So b is just going to be 4i minus 2j plus 3k. a is going to be 2i plus 3j minus 4k. And all we're going to do is just group the i's, j's, and k's respectively to kind of get this a bit neater. So in terms of the i's, what do we have? We have 4i minus 2i, so 2i. J's, we have minus 2, minus 3, so minus 5J. In K's, we have plus 3, minus, minus 4. So that'll be 3 plus 4, which is 7. Okay, so that's AB. And we know that this must be equal to BD. So BD, well, what's that going to be equal to? Similar thing, it's just going to be D minus B. So the second take away the first. So D is our unknown here, isn't it? So I'm just going to leave that as D because we're going to end up kind of rearranging the equation for that. But then minus B, which we do know, which is this 4i minus 2j plus 3k. So we know that this thing must be equal to this thing up here. So I'm now going to add this to both sides of the equation. So I'm just going to get D equals, and then this stuff here, the 2i minus 5j plus 7k and then plus this thing here. So this whole bracket, so that's gonna be plus 4i minus 2j plus 3k. Similar thing now, group all the i's, j's and k's, okay? So 2i plus 4i is gonna be 6i, minus 5j minus 2j is gonna be minus 7j, and plus 7k plus 3k is gonna be plus 10k. Simple as that, cool. So part b says, given that ac equals four, and you've got these lines here. So these lines mean the magnitude of AC. So I'll talk about that in a second. It says find the value of A. Okay, so this is essentially the magnitude of a vector. Imagine I have the vector that takes me from point A to point C. You know, let's, let's imagine this in two dimensions, but it extends to three dimensions. You know, it's going to go, you know, some kind of amount in I and then some amount in J. In reality, it does K as well, but the example holds. So don't worry about that. So the magnitude of the vector is essentially just the length of this actual vector here. We're given the vector in components, you know, this much to the right, this much up, but we just want the length of the actual line joining these things. Well, if we know all of these components here, what we can do is we can use Pythagoras. So if we were to work out AC, you know, in component form as a vector, we can then use Pythagoras to get its magnitude. So we'll show you what that looks like. We're going to do the same as part A here. So AC as a vector is just going to equal C minus A. So let's do this again and group the terms. So C is going to be AI plus 5J minus 2K. And then A is going to be 2I plus 3J minus 4K. Cool. Group it up. So I's, we have A minus 2. J's, we have plus 5 minus 3, so plus 2J. K's, we have minus 2 minus minus 4, so that's minus 2 plus 4, which is positive 2. So we now have the component form of this vector AC. So if I was to say, okay, let's work out the magnitude of this, what's it going to be? Well, it's going to be, you know, the square root of all of those terms squared, because that's Pythagoras theorem, right, which also applies in three dimensions. So this is going to be the square root of the i component squared plus the j component squared plus squared. Fantastic. But wait a minute. We know that this must be equal to 4, okay? So if we were to set this equal to 4, we have ourselves an equation. Okay, so let's just kind of make this, make our lives easy. So I don't like this square root. Why don't we just square both sides? So we're just going to get a minus 2 squared. And then these two terms, well, 2 squared is 4, and we've got two lots of that, so this is going to be 8. And then I need to square the right-hand side, so 4 squared is 16. Cool. So it's quadratic, isn't it? I've got an A term, which is squared. So I could multiply out this bracket. I don't think we need to, though, because what if I was to just take that A over to the other side, then square root, because I've only got that this one A here. I can actually just rearrange the equation for it. So I'm going to take 8 from both sides to get A minus 2 squared equals 8. I'm then going to square root, being very careful to keep this plus minus, because remember, it's quadratic, we need two solutions, and when we square root, we always need a plus minus. Final step, I'm going to take this 2 to the other side to get a equals 2 plus minus the square root of 8. You might be tricked into thinking that you're done here, but just be super careful. 
every time you get more than one solution for you know something you're trying to find in the question, just have a look through the question again to see if there's anything that will let you discard one of the solutions. So, you know, there might be two solutions for A, but let's have a look to see, because if there's just one, then I want to give that specific one. So look at this kind of long line in the question. It says where A is constant and A is less than zero. So there we go. We go straight away. Ah, look at this. Two plus root eight is positive and two minus root eight is negative because root eight is bigger than two. So I know that I only actually care about one of these solutions. So I need to say, well, okay, well, A is less than zero. Therefore, the solution of A that I care about is going to be the two minus the square root of A. So if you want, you could simplify this third. So root eight is actually the same as two root two. That's up to you. But essentially, A is going to be two minus two root two. It's of proof. So if M and N are irrational numbers where they're not equal, and MN, so N times N is also irrational, disprove this statement by means of a counterexample. Okay, so essentially, we need to find two numbers. They both need to be irrational. And then when we times them together, we need a number that, that is rational, okay? So a nice number, an integer, a nice fraction or something like that. So, well, let's think of irrational numbers. A few kind of irrational numbers that we know. Things like pi and e are irrational. Root 2, or quite a lot of square roots, are irrational as well. We actually kind of have some pretty standard proof that you want to remember, actually. So is there anything that we could do with this stuff? Let's say one of the numbers is root 2. Now, we know that root 2 times root 2 is going to be rational, but the question says that these two numbers aren't allowed to be equal to each other. So is there any way that we could almost find the number that would outdo this kind of horrible irrationality here? What if I had this? What if I just did 1 divided by root 2? This is still an irrational number, and they're not the same, but if I times them together, what's going to happen? Well, the root twos are going to cancel and I'm just going to get one. So that's enough there. Both of these are irrational, but when I times them together, it's rational. And that's all you need. You only need one counterexample and you disproved it. So bit of an easy one. So sketch the graph of y equals the modulus of x plus three. All right. So kind of think about it bit by bit. The graph of the modulus of x, well, what's that going to look like? It's going to kind of look like this here. It's a pretty standard kind of V shape that we should know. Now, I then just have to add 3 to it, and that's just going to add 3 to the y values. So essentially, I'm going to grab this thing here. I'm just going to kind of shift it up by about 3. Not about 3. It's not by exactly 3. So this thing here is going to be 3. And that's the graph there. So let's just label this quickly. This is going to be y equals the modulus of x plus 3. And then I suppose for the second part, let's have a look at what we need to do. We need to explain why the modulus of x plus 3, so what we've just sketched, is greater than or equal to the modulus of x plus 3. Okay, so I mean, it's definitely going to be related to what we've just done. So if you think about it, if we've already got the modulus of x plus 3 on the graph, why don't I just sketch the other thing on the right hand side, the modulus of x plus 3, and then hopefully if this thing here is just always above the other thing, then it's always going to be greater than or equal to it, okay? So let's sketch y equals the modulus of x plus 3 and see what happens. So y equals x plus 3, if I was to just, just to sketch that, let's, let's go blue, it would essentially be a line, goes in at 3 and it's got a gradient of 1, so this bit's actually going to be the same as it, and it's going to kind of look like this, it's going to go down here like this. So for positive x values, it's actually going to be exactly the same, but then it's going to go down here like this, but that's not what our graph looks like, because our graph's going to be the modulus, so everything that's negative is just going to get flipped up here. So this bit's going to be the same, so I'm going to get rid of this. So this bit's going to be the same, but then the negative ones are just going to be flipped up. And all of these lines kind of have the same gradient here because the gradient is just 1 or minus 1. So what does that tell us? Well, for x is greater than 0, so for x is greater than 0, they're actually the same. The modulus of x plus 3 is going to be equal to the modulus of x plus 3. But... For x is less than, well, that's going to be for x greater than or equal to 0 as well. But then for x is less than 0, 
we can see that this thing's actually higher. We can see that this thing is going to be greater than the modulus of x plus 3. So essentially, you know, and you can also kind of give them a bit of explanation. You could also say, you know, the graph of, um, well, this, this graph of this, and then we could say is, or is either equal to or above the graph of this thing here. So therefore, you know, from these from these two things, we can clearly see that x plus three is always greater than or equal to the modulus of x plus three there. Question four, show that the sum from r equals one to 16 of three plus five r plus two to the r equals that number. Okay, so this is sigma notation and essentially, uh, what you what you're allowed to do with sigma notation is split it up okay so the sum of all of these things added together is going to be kind of the sum of this thing plus the sum of this thing plus the sum of this thing so what we can do is if if parts of them kind of behave nicely together we can split that up with another sum for example the first two terms are linear okay three plus five r that seems like a nice sum but then i add in this two to the r and it gets a bit strange but what I'm allowed to do here is just say that this is the same as, and then split the sums up. And I think that's gonna be easier here, and I'll show you what I mean. This is the same as the sum of this, and then plus the sum of the two to the r. So now it's actually just kind of split itself up into two different problems, but each of these problems now looks pretty manageable, okay? So this first thing, this is gonna be an arithmetic series, and the reason it is, Every time r goes up by one, what happens? I just add another five here. Like, think about it. The first term is going to be three plus this five. But then the second term is going to be three plus two lots of five. And then it's going to be three lots of five, etc. So all that's happening is I'm adding five each time. That's an arithmetic series. So what I can do is to get this sum, I can actually use the formula for the sum of an arithmetic series, which is nice. And that is going to be the following. So there's a couple of different ways I can kind of do it. The one that I'm gonna use now is basically n over two, so Sn essentially, is gonna be n over two times a plus l, where a is gonna be the first term and l is gonna be the last term. And n is gonna be the amount of terms. So you can see I've got 16 terms. A, well, what's that gonna be? It's gonna be the first term. So again, that's this, isn't it? The three plus five. So that's gonna be eight and then plus L at the last term. Well, the last term is when R equals 16. So if I was to sub R equals 16 into this, what would happen? Well, I would get three plus five times 16. So this here, I can simplify it slightly. That is gonna be the sum of that bit, and then gonna add it to the one on the right. So 16 over two is gonna be eight, and then times by eight plus three, plus five times 16, that's gonna get me 728. Okay, so let's park that. The second one, what have I got here? Two to the power of R, okay? So thinking about these terms here, what's gonna happen? I'm gonna get two, that's two to the one, and then two squared, two cubed. What's happening? I'm timesing by two each time, aren't I? So if I'm timesing by something each time, it's gonna be a geometric series. So Formula for the sum of a geometric series, Sn, is going to be a times one minus r to the n, all over one minus r. a is the first term, r is the common ratio, and n is the amount of terms. So a, first term, r to the one is gonna be two. One minus r, well that's also gonna be two because I'm times them by two each time, to the power of 16, which is n, over one minus two. Straight to the calculator again, so I'm gonna get two times by, 1 minus 2 to the power of 16 all over 1 minus 2 and that's going to get me something rather large 131070 so now hopefully i'm going to add these two together and it's all going to work out so therefore you know my total sum is going to equal 728 plus 131070 and let's hope so i've got this second one installed in my ants i'm just going to do ants 
plus 728. That gets me 131798. Go to the answer. And that is the thing that we're trying to show. Perfect. Okay, let's look at the second part of the question. A sequence is defined by u of n plus 1, so it's a recurrence relation. So it takes takes the, the last sum and then it says, okay, this is what the next sum is in terms of, uh, not the sum, the last term in terms of the next term. So in other words, u of n plus 1 is 1 over u of n. So to get the next term, you just do 1 divided by the last term. And then u of 1 is 2 over 3. Find the exact value and then we want the sum of the first 100 terms, essentially. Okay, so with recurrence relations, it's usually a good idea to just put a few terms in and just start seeing what happens. So for example, if u1 is this, we just say, well, okay, what's u2 gonna be? What's u3 gonna be? And then we might start seeing patterns. And then as soon as you have a pattern, it's a lot easier to work from that. So u2 is gonna be one divided by this, isn't it? One over two over three. But if I have one divided by a fraction, doesn't that just flip the fraction? So this three is going to travel up here. So that's going to be three over two. Okay. So then u three, well, it's going to be one over that, isn't it? So that's going to be one over three over two. But wait a minute. Now that's just going to be two over three because I'm going to flip the fraction again. So look what's happened. I'm at two over three, go to three over two, go back to two over three. And it's just going to repeat from here, isn't it? So we're seeing here that the odd terms, u one, u three, u five, etc going to be 2 over 3, and the even terms, u2, u4, you know, u100, is going to be 3 over 2. So the question is, in the sum from 1 to 100, how many lots of 2 over 3 do I have, and how many lots of 3 over 2 do I have? Well, I'm just going to have 50 of each, aren't I? Because 1 to 100, I get the 50 even numbers and the 50 odd numbers. So I'm going to get the 50 lots of 2 over 3, and then I'm going to get the 50 lots of three over two. And I just work this out and that is gonna be my answer. So straight away to the calculator, 50 times two over three plus 50 times three over two is going to get me 325 over three. Moving on, the equation two x cubed plus x squared minus one equals zero has exactly one real root. Show that for this equation, the newton raphson formula can be written as all of that stuff there. All right. Let's imagine that you have absolutely no idea what the newton raphson formula is. Not a clue, not a clue. I reckon you can still get the marks here. So here's what I'd do. I'd say newton raphson formula, hmm, maybe it's in my formula booklet. It's a formula, maybe it's in my formula booklet. If you were to find this in your formula booklet, which by the way it is in, you would get the following. xn plus 1 equals xn minus f of xn over f prime of xn. I'm thinking, huh, okay. Now, <clears throat> maybe I don't actually know where this formula comes from or why it's the case, but I reckon I could apply it here because look what we're trying to do here. We're trying to solve the equation f of x, which equals kind of this thing here, this 2x cubed plus x squared minus 1. We're trying to solve that equals 0. So imagine I have no idea where this formula comes from or what the actual kind of interpretation of it is. I can go, hmm, why don't I just sub this formula into here and see what they get? I reckon I can get the marks here. If this is f of x, I'm going to need to work out f prime of x, you know, the derivative of x. So let's do that quickly. Well, what I'm going to get, I'm going to get 6x squared plus 2x. And then I go, okay, let's sub it in and see what happens, okay? So I'm going to get xn plus 1 equals xn minus f of xn. So I'm going to sub xn into this. So 2xn cubed plus xn squared minus 1. And then all of that, I need to sub in xn into the derivative. So 6xn squared plus 2xn. Let's just clean it up and see what happens. They've got one fraction and we've not yet. So I want that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to times this by this denominator here. And then I'm going to put it all into one fraction because I'll have a common denominator. So I'm going to get xn times by all of this stuff. So 6xn squared plus 2xn minus, and then it's going to be this. Make sure you put a bracket in here because I'm taking away this whole fraction. So if I was to just write this minus, you know, 2xn cubed plus xn squared minus 1, that would be incorrect because what I'm actually doing is minusing this whole fraction. So I need that bracket. All of this is just going to be over that same denominator now. So 6xn squared 
plus 2xn. We've got the bottom that they have, so let's just hope that the top clears up and gets to the same as there, and I've got my three marks. So let's multiply out this first bracket to get what? 6xn cubed plus 2xn squared, and they're going to take away this bracket, so minus 2xn cubed minus xn squared, and then plus that one, because that's two minuses, divided by that same denominator. Now, what do we have? x cubed, so we've got six minus two of them, so four of them. x squared, so we've got two minus one of them, so one of them. And the numbers, I've just got this one scraggling on the end, yeah? So that's what I have, and I'm going to hope that that is what they have too, and it is, so three marks. Cool. Now, part B, you don't even need to have got part A, and you're nowhere near needing to even understand what newton raphson is, because all it says is using the formula given in part A, so the formula's right there, find the values of x2 and x3. So even if you didn't do part A here, you just put it into the formula, and that's two marks, okay? Something that I like to do a lot with recurrence relations and iterations is the following. My first x value that I'm going to put in, so in this case x1 is 1, I'm going to put it in my calculator and just press equals. I've now stored 1 as the answer, as the ants, the ANS, on my calculator. I'm now going to type this formula in, but instead of xn or like 1, I'm just going to write ants. So I'm going to write 4 times ants cubed plus ants squared plus 1, all divided by 6 times ants squared plus two times ants. So in this case, it's gonna work because ants is currently stored as one, so that gets me my x2, so I'm gonna press equals, and that gets me three over four. But then, now that three over four is the thing that I've just got, that's now being stored as the ants in my calculator. So now I can just press equals again, and I'm gonna get x3. I'm not gonna to have to go back and edit this formula at all, so it's gonna save me a lot of time here. Press equals again, and I get two over three. So now I only need to get x2 and x3 in this case. But if I want to go on or see the long-term behavior, I get x10 or whatever, I just keep pressing my equals button. And all that happens is it keeps doing these iterations for me. So you can see in this case, it kind of goes towards, you know, converges nicely to 0 0.657, but it's really, really useful, this method with the ants button in your calculator. Okay, part C says, Explain why for this question, the newton raphson method cannot be used with x1 equals zero. So this is probably the point where we need a bit more knowledge about newton raphson and kind of what it means. But even if you don't, you've got five out of six marks not having a clue, so that's pretty good, right? So essentially, newton raphson so it's kind of an iteration method to find out where a function crosses the x-axis, right, when it's equal to zero. So, you know, let's say I've got a function like this. All you essentially do is you take an initial guess, and then what you do is you, is you go up to the function, so find the y value of that, or f of x in this case. What you then do is you draw a tangent, and this is important. You draw a tangent from, you know, the function at this point, and then wherever this hits the x-axis, you then go and find out, the, you know, the corresponding points on the curve, and then draw another tangent. You keep drawing these tangents and going in. So, you know, here I draw a tangent here, go to the x, um, find out where it hits the x-axis, same thing, keep drawing my tangents, and you hope to zone in on that point, okay? Now, x1 equals zero. So how could this not work, okay? So it's about essentially drawing a tangent and then finding where that tangent hits the x-axis. Pretty much, almost all tangents here are gonna hit the x-axis from this curve. There is a case in which they won't though. What if I have a stationary point at this curve? What if I'm right here and my tangent looks like this? My tangent is completely horizontal as in it's got a gradient of zero. That ain't hitting the x-axis, is it? So I hope here that for x1 equals zero, I'm gonna get this gradient of zero, so it's a stationary point. So I know the derivative, I've got that derivative function. Remember, the derivative function is six x squared plus two x, it's what's on the bottom here. So let's work out what the derivative is at x equals zero, well look, six times zero squared plus two times zero. That's equal to zero. So I've got a stationary point at x equals zero, so the tangents will never 
hit the x-axis. You can also see how this is kind of going to mathematically break down because in the formula, I get the derivative on the bottom. But if I'm trying to divide by the derivative and the derivative zero, you divide it by zero there, not going to work out. So that's why. Question six. We're given a function. It's a cubic. So, you know, minus three is cubed, is eight squared, minus nine is plus 10. So it's some big cubic. And it says calculate f of two. Okay, so first part, relatively simple, isn't it? I just sub in two for x here. Okay, so what am I going to get? I'm going to get minus three times two cubed plus eight times two squared minus nine times two plus 10. So straight away, I'm just going to go to my calculator. So I'm going to get minus three times two cubed plus eight times two squared minus nine times two plus 10. And I get zero, right? This is going to be, this is going to be relevant. Okay. Why is that? Because of the factor theorem. So the factor theorem states that if f of x, well, no, let's do it the other way. So if f of a is zero, then x minus a is a factor of f. So what does it mean to be a factor? It means that f of x can then be expressed as x minus a, or in our case, x minus two times by something, okay? And look, it's asking us now to write f of x as a product of two algebraic factors. So I've got one of them, haven't I? All I have to do is find out this something. So a couple of ways you could do this. I'm gonna do polynomial division, so long division here. So what I'm gonna do is if I just divide my f of x, this whole cubic, by x minus two, I'm gonna get this other factor here, aren't I? So let's do that now. So I'm gonna have x minus two here, and then in a big thing, I'm gonna have minus three x cubed plus eight x squared minus nine x plus 10, okay? So then this thing here is all gonna be underneath this. So polynomial long division, let's see what we can remember. Essentially, let's get this neat, let's, let's make this good. Okay, I need to first of all find out, I need to look at this and this, and I say, okay, how many times does this go into this? In other words, what do I need to times this by to get this? Well, if I times x by minus 3x squared, I'm gonna get minus 3x cubed. I'm now gonna take this minus 3x squared and times it by this and this and write the terms in their corresponding columns. So minus 3x squared times x is gonna be minus 3x cubed, and this should be the same as this because that's the way we've set this up. And then minus 3x squared times minus 2 is going to be plus 6x squared. Now I'm going to take this from the top one. So these two are going to cancel. And then I have 8x squared minus 6x squared is going to be 2x squared. And then, you know, there's no terms here. So I'm still going to have that minus 9x and I'm still going to have that 10. And I'll repeat. So I'll say, how many times does x go into 2x squared? Well, it goes plus 2x and I then bring this 2x times it by both of these. So 2x times x is 2x squared. 2x times minus two. I've gone, here we go. I've lost the plot here, there we go. So 2x times minus two is going to be minus four x. And then again, this 10 is still here, isn't it? So what I'm now, what I'm now gonna do is do this, take away this, so I get 2x squared minus 2x squared, they cancel as they should. Minus 9x minus minus 4x is going to be minus 5x because I'm adding that. And then again, I've got this 10 here, haven't I? Again, how many times does x go into minus 5x? Well, it goes minus 5. And then take this minus 5 times by the whole thing. So I'm going to get minus 5x and then plus 10. And if you look here, because these two cancel, I've got no remainder here. And we knew that should have happened because we know, you know, prior that x minus two should have been a factor of this thing. So I, I know I'm, I shouldn't get a remainder here. What does that tell me? That tells me that f of x is going to equal x minus two times by this thing here. This is my other algebraic factor. Fantastic, okay. Using your answer to part A2, prove that there are exactly two real solutions to the equation, that thing there. What is this equation? Minus three y to the six plus eight y to the four minus nine y squared plus 10 equals zero. Can we see any similarities with what we have here and our original f of x? 
Well, we can, can't we, right? Because if you look at this, all of these numbers in front are the same. The only difference is the kind of power of this variable. So is there any transformation that I can use that's going to get me from f of x to this? What if I set x equals y squared? I'm going to get the exact same thing, aren't I? So it's almost like this equation here. We kind of have f of y squared equals zero, don't we? So that means that the solutions to this equation are going to be intrinsically linked to the solutions of the top equation, this f of x equals zero, right? So here's what I'm going to do using your answer to part A2. So we're going to be using this, right? We're going to be using this. Why don't we just see when f of x is equal to zero? And then from that, we can kind of deduce the solutions to this equation here. So f of x equals zero is going to imply, I'm going to, there's going to be two ways I'm going to get solutions. It's going to be either this thing being zero. So that instantly tells us x equals two. I've got a nice solution. Or it's going to be this thing equaling zero plus two x minus five equals zero. Okay, so if this thing has no solutions, then f of x equals zero only has this one, right? So how am I going to work out the solutions of this? Not even the solutions, how many solutions there are. Well, it's quadratic, so I can use the discriminant. So D, which is the discriminant, equals B squared minus 4AC, where A, B, and C are the coefficients of these x squared, x, and number terms, respectively. So B is going to be 2, so it's going to be 2 squared minus 4 times A is going to be minus 3. C is going to be minus 5, and I'm going to work out what this is. So 2 squared minus 4 times minus 3 times minus 5, a lot of minuses, but I get minus 56. So that is negative. The discriminant of a quadratic is negative. It has no real solutions, okay? This is important. No real solutions. So we know that the equation f of x equals 0 only has one solution, but that's not what the question says. It says two real solutions because we're not doing f of x equals zero, we're doing f of y squared equals zero. So in other words, this isn't gonna give us any solutions, but the solution that we are gonna have is the x equals two. But we're now interested in not x equals two, y squared equals two. So this is the only way we get solutions, and the two solutions gonna be y is then gonna equal plus minus the square root of two. So two solutions. Cool, deduce the number of real solutions of theta between 7 pi and 10 pi to the equation, then something that's got a load of trig in it, but kind of looks like what we're used to in this question, right? Because look, 3 tan cubed theta minus 8 tan squared theta plus 9 tan theta minus 10 equals 0. Kind of looks like f of x. It's not quite there, though, is it? But wait a minute. This is equaling 0. So if I just swap the sign of everything, you know, I took it onto the other side, what would I get? If you think about it, if I have f of x equals zero, you know, that gives me this minus three x cubed plus eight x squared minus nine x plus 10 equals zero. But what if I was to just bring everything onto the other side? So this, 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 and this all go to the other side. The signs are just gonna swap, aren't they? So I'm gonna get three x cubed minus eight x squared plus nine x minus 10 equals zero. Now we're getting somewhere. If this x was just tan theta, what would I get? I'd get three tan cubed theta minus eight tan squared theta plus nine tan theta minus 10 equals zero. So we really know that this equation is actually the same as f of x equals zero, which, which we've already shown has this one solution, okay? So the only the only solution that we're gonna get from this is, well, my x is now tan theta, remembering that this quadratic doesn't get us any solutions, but this one does. So my input equaling two is the only way I get solutions here. So tan theta equals two is the only way I get solutions here. The quadratic, no, I don't. Okay, so now we'll say, well, how many solutions am I gonna have in this interval? Now remember, the tan graph, it's actually relatively easy because it's just the same thing, this kind of squiggle, and it just repeats every pi. So essentially, when I want new solutions for tan, all I do is I just add a pi. I say, okay, I've got one here, add pi, add pi. In other words, for each pi, I get one solution. 
So if my range here is of three pi, it's between seven pi and 10 pi, I'm gonna get three solutions. So I'm just gonna go straight away. That's got three solutions. I get one solution for each pi. And that's question six. Question seven, looks like we've got some trig. So solve for x between zero and pi by two, the equation four sine x equals sec x. Okay, so with these reciprocal functions, you know, sec, cosec, cot, think of the third letter, and that's gonna tell you which one it re refers to, essentially. The third letter of sec is C, so that's gonna be cos. So in other words, this is gonna be one over cos x. I'm gonna just kind of rearrange a bit and see what I can get. I wanna get rid of this fraction, so I'm gonna do this. I times up by this cos x here. So it's gonna equal one. Now, four times sine x cos x. If I have a sine x cos x together, that makes me think of the double angle formula for sine, because I know that sine two x is equal to two sine x cos x. So this is useful because what I have here is two lots of two sine x cos x. So what that's gonna tell me is that I actually just have two sine two x equals one here. So divide by that two and what do I get? I get sine two x equals a half. Now I wanna solve this for x being between naught and pi by two, but if x is between naught and pi by two, then 2x is between naught and pi. Now that's quite important because if I now just do a bit of the sine graph, essentially pi is here, isn't it? So I know I'm gonna get these two solutions here and here. Now, if I do inverse sine of a half, uh, I'm actually gonna get 30 degrees or pi by six. That's just kind of because I know that, but feel free to do it in your calculator, making sure you're in radians here. So I'm gonna get solutions for 2x being pi by six, or, and then I'm gonna use this symmetry here. So I'm gonna get this other one by doing pi minus pi by six. So that's gonna be five pi by six. So because their solution is for two x, I now need to divide by two to get my solutions as pi by 12, five pi by 12. So we are really important to remember about the range there. Cool, okay, second part. Solve for theta between naught and 360, the equation five sine theta, minus five cos theta equals two. Okay, so a couple of things I want to make a note of here. This two is actually quite annoying. If I didn't have this two, if it was a zero, for example, this equation would be quite easy because I could take this cos over the other side, I could actually divide by cos and then I'd just be left with a five tan theta equals one, and then I've got one trig function and I'm good. The fact that I've got that two there makes it quite annoying. I need to think of something else that is gonna get this into one trig function. And what we're gonna use is the multiple angle formulas. So what I'm gonna do here, because I've got a minus, I'm gonna use R sine, and then I'm gonna do theta and then minus alpha, where R and alpha, we're gonna find out. And what we can do is use the multiple angle formula to actually see what this would be. So this is gonna be the following. This is gonna be R cos alpha sine theta minus r sine alpha cos theta. Now the reason this is in, uh, kind of useful is because if we compare these two things, what do we get? We've got this sine theta here, meaning this must be the same. So meaning five must equal r cos alpha. And then look, I've got this minus minus. So I also should get this five as our sine alpha. So that means if I solve these two equations simultaneously for r and alpha, I'm gonna be able to express this thing on the left of my equation in this form. I'll have one trig function and I'm good. So what can I do here? The first thing that we can do is we can divide these equations. If I call this one and two, if I do equation two divided by equation one, I can get a nice kind of trig identity come out because I'm gonna get r sine alpha divided by r cos alpha Look what happens, R's cancel, and sine alpha divided by cos alpha is gonna be tan alpha. So I'm gonna get tan alpha here. And then what's this gonna equal on the right-hand side? Well, equation two divided by equation one, I get five over five. So I get tan alpha equals one. Now, tan alpha equals one at 45 degrees, or pi by four. 
And um, so in this case, we're in degrees. I'm going to say 45 degrees here. So alpha is going to be 45. So all I need to do now is get R. So there's a few ways that I can do this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to square both of these equations and I'll show you why. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, well, five squared is going to equal R squared cos squared alpha. And then similarly, five squared is going to equal R squared sine squared alpha from equation two. I'm going to add these together now and use another trig identity. If I was to add the left hand side, the right hand sides together, I would get R squared. I'd be able to take the R squared out and I'd get a cos squared alpha plus sine squared alpha here. Adding the left hand sides, well, five squared is 25 and I've got two lots of that. So I'm going to get 50. But what trig identity can we use here? Cos squared plus sine squared is always equal to one. So this thing's going to be one. R squared is going to be 50. So I know that R must be the square root 50. Cool. What does that tell me? That tells me that I can completely rewrite my equation as the following. Root 50 sine of theta minus 45 is going to be equal to. And that, this is good because I've got one trig function. As soon as I've got one trig function, I can then solve it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to isolate this trig function. Divide by the root 50 to get sine of theta minus 45 equals 2 divided by root 50. At this point, I can start thinking about my solutions. So, sine graph looks like this. Now, my range is actually going to... So, my, my range for theta is between 0 and 360, okay? I'm actually shifting this down by 45 degrees. So, my actual range is going to be about, you know, 45 degrees this way. And then 360 minus another 45 degrees. So I'm actually going to be working within these bounds here. Now, in this case, that doesn't really matter because my solutions are for when this thing's positive. So I'm kind of looking at when it hits this line anyway. Now, we have to be careful about this because, for example, if it was plus 45, there would have been a chance that my range would have excluded this solution here. So we need to be really careful about that range. It's not in this case, though, is it? Because I'm taking 45 degrees away. I'm not losing any solutions down here or gaining any. I'm the same on this side. So in this case, my solutions are going to be the same. So that's really worth noting because it's really worth kind of drawing the graph and really seeing, wait a minute, is the fact that I've got this altered range going to alter my solutions here? Luckily here it doesn't. So what I can do is say, okay, that means my solutions for theta minus 45 are going to be, and then I'm just going to go straight to my calculator. I'm going to make sure I'm in degrees. I'm going to do the inverse sine of 2 divided by the square root of 50. That is going to get me one solution here, which is 16.4299 dot 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 before the final answer, you know, do a lot more significant figures then round at the end. So to get this one, I'm going to do 180 minus that's so 180 minus amps. And that's going to get me 163.5700 dot dot dot. Now I add the 45. Okay, so my two solutions for theta are going to be 16.4299 etc plus 45. Now what does it want? It wants one decimal place. So my first one it's going to be 61.4 degrees. And then for the second one, I'm going to do 163.57 plus 45, which is going to be to one decimal place, 208.6 degrees. Whew, moving on. Figure one is a graph showing the trajectory of a rugby ball. The height of the ball above the ground H has been plotted against the horizontal distance X meters measured from the point where the ball was kicked. Okay. It travels in a vertical plane and it reaches a maximum height of 12 meters and hits the ground at a point 40 meters from where it is kicked. And the quadratic, cool, so we're modeling it as a quadratic, that's very good to know, um, linking H with X that models the situation. So we've got a quadratic plotted for us. So then we just need to know, okay, well, how do quadratics behave? You know, what terms am I going to have? And how can I use the information that's given to me to get these terms? Okay, so the first couple of pieces of information I'm going to use is where it hits the x-axis. We can see that it hits the origin and we can see that it hits at 40. What does that mean? That means that when x equals 0, h must equal 0. 
That must mean that x must be a factor here. You know, it must be x times something. Because I need, when I put x equals 0 in, for this thing to be 0. So that encapsulates the fact that it hits at the origin. So similar thing for this bracket. I need, when x equals 40, for h to be 0. So in other words, I could just say x minus 40 here. So I've almost done, actually. Here, this satisfies both of the points where it hits, but I've not yet incorporated the fact that it reaches a maximum of 12. So I'm going to need a constant out front here because I'm, you know, I can't add anything on here because then it wouldn't be zero at these points. So I'm going to need to be times by some constant. Call it whatever you want, A. Let's call it A. So what can I use to get this constant A? Well, the thing that we haven't used yet is that I'm going to reach a maximum of 12, so h equals 12, and what is the x value that I'm going to need to put in to get that? Well, it's a quadratic, so it's symmetrical, so it's going to reach its maximum right in the middle, which is when x is going to equal 20, because it goes between 0 and 40, right? So, in other words, if I sub in 20 here, then that should sort me out. So, what am I going to get? 20 minus 40 is minus 20, and then times 20, that's going to be minus 400. A. So A is just going to be minus 12 over 400, which, if we put this into our calculator, is going to get me minus 0.03. Cool. So that's actually giving me H, hasn't it? I get H equals minus 0.03x times X minus 40, because this is the equation that satisfies all three of those things that I need to happen. Now, if you want, you don't need to, but if you want, this negative might annoy you a bit. What I can do is I can absorb this negative into this bracket here. So if I kind of times this bit by minus 1 to just get 0.03, can't type, 0.03x, and then I can times this by minus 1. So these minus 1s are essentially cancelling and I'm not affecting the value of the whole thing. So instead of x minus 40, I just have 40 minus x. You don't need to do that, it's optional. Cool, okay, the ball passes over a horizontal bar of a set of rugby posts that is perpendicular to the path of the ball. The bar is three meters above the ground. Use your equation to find the greatest horizontal distance of the bar from O. So this is really easy, right? And the reason is because we have an equation for H, the height above the ground, as a function of the horizontal distance. So that's all I need here, because I need to know when the height is three. So all I need to do is solve this thing here. And then essentially my x values are going to be my answer because it says the horizontal distance, that's the x. So let's multiply this thing out to get what? I'm going to get 40 times by 0 0.03, so 0 0.03 times 40 and then lots of x, minus 0 0.03 times x squared. So 0 0.03 times 40 is going to be 1.2, so I get 1.2x minus 0.03x squared here. Now, let's get this all onto one side, because that's what we do with quadratics, right? So 0.03x squared minus this 1.2x plus 3 is equal to 0. Now, the numbers aren't great here, are they? So why don't we just go straight to our calculator to just read off the solutions here. Let's be lazy. So menu, go down, go to equation func, so for function, 2, which is polynomial, select the degree. Now, this is the, power, the highest power of x, which is 2. The coefficient since so 0 0.03, boom, minus 1.2, boom, and then 3. Now I just press equals, you get in your solutions. So the two solutions I get here are x equals 20 plus minus 10 root 3. So which one do we use? Well, look, it says greatest horizontal distance. So the greatest horizontal distance is going to be, you know, the bigger number, which I'm going to get from doing 20 plus 10 root 3. So the one that I care about. 20 plus 10 root 3. Cool. Give one limitation of the model. So the model's all right, but look at what the model is saying. The model is saying that it's just perfectly symmetrical. Is that really going to happen, you know? In a perfect world with no spin and no air resistance or wind or anything like that, it'd nicely do that. But a lot of things are actually going to happen here. Imagine if I kick the ball but then the wind starts, you know, as soon as it's falling down, the wind starts going this way to the left. Is it going to nicely go in exactly the same trajectory as it went up? Probably not. So there are many things that this really doesn't take into account. So just pretty simply, I could say, you know, it doesn't account for wind. 
to wind air resistance. There are a lot of things you could say. It's just a quick mark there though. So that should be enough for question eight. Okay, it looks like we've got a bit of a quicker one for question nine. So it says, given that theta was measured in radians, prove from first principles that the derivative of cos theta is minus sine theta essentially. Okay, so the first thing that we should really note here is what differentiation from first principles is. So it basically tells us that the derivative of f of x is the limit as h tends to zero of f of x plus h minus f of x all divided by h. If you would like a full explanation of why this is the case, head on over to AI Tutor. The link is in the description. Whew, okay, got that one out of the way. So essentially, here, my f of x, or f of theta, or whatever, is just going to be this cos of theta. So I'm just going to sub everything straight in. So I'm going to use theta instead of x here, and then my f is going to be cos, okay? So this is going to be the limit, in my case, as h tends to zero of cos of theta plus h minus, and then f of x or f of theta in this case, cos of theta, okay? All of this is going to be divided by h. Now we're told that we can assume the formula for cos of a plus minus b, so let's assume that right now. So essentially what this tells us is that cos of a plus b is cos a cos b minus sine a sine b. So it's going to be cos theta cos h minus sine theta sine h. Got this cos theta still on the end, and then all of this is still divided by h. Okay, it also gives us a couple of limits, so we're definitely going to need to use them or else they wouldn't you know, tell us about them. So how can we get these limits from what we have here? So let's look at this sine one first. Well, I've only got one sine term, haven't I? And that is going to be this minus sine theta. And then look, this sine over eight, this sine h over h we have, don't we? We have this sine h over h here. So that's my sine term. So I like that. And then the cos term, I've got this cos h minus one. Now, if we were to take cos theta out of this, what am I going to get? I'm going to get cos theta. And then what am I going to be left with in this bracket? I'm going to be left with cos h minus and then one, okay? So all of that is also divided by h. So essentially, what's going on now? I've got the limit of this whole thing, haven't I? So I'm going to have the limit as h tends to zero of this term minus this term. Well, I can just bring this limit in here because these thetas don't care about it. So in other words, I can now get these limits in. So I know that this thing here is going to tend to zero because the question tells it me. So that term is going to be gone. And then this thing here, let's look to the question. It tells me that that goes to one. In other words, this is just going to be minus sine theta times one from here, which is minus sine theta. And if you look at that, we're done already. All right, let's have a crack at question 10. A spherical mint of radius five millimeters is placed in the mouth and sucked. Bit of a strange question, but whatever. Four minutes later, the radius of the mint is three millimeters, okay? In a simple model, the rate of decrease of the radius of the mint is inversely proportional to the square of the radius, okay? Using this model and all the information given, find an equation linking the radius of the mint and the time. Okay, so you should define the variables that you use. Okay, so, well, we, we care about the radius and the time. So let's let R be, you know, the radius and then, you know, T time, okay? So this is the important bit, the rate of decrease of the radius. So rate is a derivative, okay? Rate of change is a derivative. And it's to do with time, so the rate of decrease. So it's talking about dr, the radius, by dt, okay? The rate at which r changes as t changes. Now, it says decrease. So decrease is this, this radius, this derivative is gonna be negative, okay? So it's gonna be a negative derivative. And then it says what? It is inversely proportional to the square of the radius. So that means it's gonna be k over the square of the radius, where k is a you know constant of proportionality. Proportionality. And, and k is actually gonna be positive here because I've I've said 
that this thing's negative. If I didn't put a negative sign here, it'd be fine. It'd just mean K is negative, but here K is going to be positive because I've put that minus sign in there. K. Um, I think I've defined everything here. So essentially, what have I got? I've got a simul simultaneous. I've got a differential equation, okay? So I want to separate my variables here because that's how we solve these differential equations. I need to get all of my R's onto the side with a dr and all of my t's into the side with a dt and then integrate up. So this r squared is going over to the left. So I'm going to get r squared dr by dt equals minus k. The dt flipping over to the right, okay? So I'm going to get r squared dr equals minus k dt. I'm now at a point where I can integrate, okay? So I'm going to do the integral of r squared with respect to r, which kind of makes sense. So I can do that. So that's going to be, well, I add one to the power to get r cubed, divide by the new power to get over three. And then this is going to be equal to the integral of this thing with respect to t. So k is just a constant, so it's quite easy. It's going to be minus kt. Now, I need an arbitrary constant here. So I could do it on the left, I could do it on the right, I could do it on both. I'm allowed to just do it in one place because they could both have a constant, but then if I was to take one of the constants to the other side and merge them, that's just going to be another arbitrary constant. So I'm just going to say plus C here. Now I've got two unknown constants here, haven't I? So I should hope that I get two pieces of information that I can sub in for R and T. And if you look at this, it says, well, a spherical, the radius of the mint itself is five millimeters. So in other words, when T equals zero, it hasn't been sucked at all. It's going to be five. So in other words, when t equals zero, r is five. So I'm going to get five cubed over three equals, this term is going to be zero, so this is going to be c. Five cubed is 125, so c is going to be one, two, five over three. And then it says, four minutes later, the radius is three. So I'm going to sub t equals four and r equals three here. So I'm going to get three cubed over three equals minus k times four and then plus my value of C, which is one, two, five over three. So what I'm gonna get here, I'm gonna get, let's bring this K over here. So I'm gonna get four K equals one, two, five over three minus three cubed over three. So let's, yeah, let's find out what this is equal to first. So I am going to do one, two, five over three minus three cubed over three to get me 98 over three. I'm then gonna divide by four to get K equals answer divided by four to be 49 over six. So I believe that, you know, that, that's all I need here in this case, isn't it? Cool. Hence find the total time taken for the mint to completely dissolve. Okay. So well, what would it mean for the mint to dissolve in this model? Well, it would mean that the radius is no more. What's happening is I'm eating this mint and then the radius is getting smaller and smaller. So in other words, I just need to find in this equation that I have, you know, derived for R and T when R goes to zero, essentially. So if I just set R equals zero here, what am I going to get? I'm going to get zero on the left hand side and then equals K, which is 49 over six minus K, not just K minus kt, and then plus c, which is 1, 2, 5 over 3. All I need to do is solve this equation. So not too bad. So I'm going to take this over the other side, and then I'm going to divide by 49 over 6. So I've essentially got 1, 2, 5 over 3, all over 49 over 6. Straight to my calculator. 1, 2, 5 over 3, divided by 49 over 6, which will get me... 5.102 dot 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 and it says total time so this t is in minutes but we need to be careful because i want to you know i want to say five minutes and however many seconds so i've got i've got the five minutes here and then i just need to get this one point you know point one oh two of a minute in seconds so for, there's obviously 60 seconds in a minute so if i do not point one oh two times by 60 and you get 6.12, which rounded to the nearest second is six. So it's gonna be five minutes and six seconds. The model predicts that it will totally dissolve. Okay, so just a limitation. Well, I mean, it's quite a few, right? 
It's a bit of a weird model, isn't it? Like, imagine, you know, I'm kind of, I've got this mint and it's in my mouth. Like, it's not just going to be this perfect sphere the whole time, is it? And just, just stay being a, a perfect sphere and then just go to nothing, like, perfectly, is it? So, I mean, I would probably say the following. I would say I really doubt that this mint is going to retain the shape of a sphere all the way, um, you know, down until it dissolves. So I would say, I don't know, uh, mint would likely not retain the shape of a perfect sphere, you know, all the way until it dissolves, essentially. And I believe that would do us for question 10. Yeah, a bit of a weird one. Question 11, let's see what we have here. Looks like I have a bit of partial fractions. So we've got some big fraction over here. 1 plus 11x minus 6x squared all over. And then we have these two factors on the bottom. So x minus 3 and 1 minus 2x. It's given us the form that we want this in. So it's not too bad here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to times through by both of these factors on the bottom. I'm going to times the whole equation by x minus 3 and the whole equation by 1 minus 2x. So that would leave me on the left hand side 1 plus 11x minus 6x squared. And then on the right hand side, I'm going to get a times by both of these things that I've timed up, timesed up by. So x minus 3, 1 minus 2x plus b. Now the x minus 3s are going to cancel out, but I'm still going to get that 1 minus 2x here. And then plus c, the 1 minus 2x's have cancelled, but I still have this x minus 3. Okay, so this is an identity, meaning it's true for all values of x, and that is really important. Because what that means is, to get these values of a, b, and c, I can just sub in whatever I want as x, and then something that's going to make my life easy. For example, if I was to sub in x equals 3, it's going to get rid of this term. It's going to get rid of this term because 3 minus 3 is 0. So the only unknown constant that's going to be that's going to leave me in my equation is going to be this b. So doing this, I would get the following. 1 plus 11 times 3 minus 6 times 3 squared equals this goes, this goes. So I just get b times 1 minus 2 times 3. So not too bad, is it? So the left-hand side, I can just go to my calculator and do 1 plus... 11 times 3 minus 6 times 3 squared to get me minus 20. That's going to be equal to, well, 2 times 3 is 6. So 1 minus 6 is minus 5. So, so I get minus 5b. Divide by the minus 5 and I get b equals 4. So I can do a similar thing to get c. Just find another thing, another x value that's going to get rid of some of the brackets. Same thing again. So it's pretty tedious, isn't it? Well, you get marks, so I suppose we can't complain too much. So what is the x value that's going to get rid of these terms here? Well, if I sub x equals a half into this, it's going to make 1 minus 2x 0. So subbing in x equals a half gets me on the left 1 plus 11 times a half minus 6 times a half squared is equal to gone, gone, c, a half minus 3. Three. So again, left-hand side is going to get me 1 plus 11 times a half minus 6 times a half squared, which is 5, which is nice. And then a half minus 3 is going to be minus 2.5 or minus 5 over 2, okay? So that's going to be minus 5 over 2c. So the 5s will cancel here, won't they? Giving me 1 equals minus a half c times by 2 and the minus 1 to get what? c is going to be minus 2. Two. Woo! Okay, one more. Now, you see how a is multiplied by both of these brackets? If I use any of these numbers that nicely cancel the brackets, a is just going to get cancelled every time, isn't it? As we saw getting the b and the c. But we were only really trying hard to cancel brackets because we had so many unknowns before. You know, if I didn't cancel the brackets, I'd get these equations that have a, b, and c in them, and they're unknowns, so I'd need to do a lot of kind of pretty dirty algebra. But the unknowns are actually not unknowns anymore, are they? Because b was an unknown, but we now know it. It's 4. Same with c. So I can actually sub in anything I want for x here, and the only unknown that I'll have in the equation is going to be a. Now, a quick hint, x equals 0 is generally just going to be easy, isn't it? Because look at the left-hand side, loads of terms are going to go. It's going to be much easier on the right to just sub in x equals 0. Just generally go for that if you can. So in other words, I'm going to get this. x equals 0 is going to get me what? On the left-hand side, that goes and that goes, so I'm just left with 1. 
And then on the right hand side, I get what? So this term is going to go to one, isn't it? One minus zero. And then I get what? Zero minus three. So I'm just going to get minus three a there. The b term, well, this goes to zero. So it's just going to be b times one, which is b. And then the c term, I get what? Zero minus three in this bracket. So minus three lots of c. So if you look now, I can just sub in my b and my c, can't I? So I get equals minus 3a plus 4 minus 3 times minus 2 because that is c and that's b. Simple equation, okay? Let's take the 3a to this side. Let's take the 1 to that side. So 3a is going to equal 4 and then minus 3 times minus 2 is plus 6. Bring this one over, minus 1. 4 plus 6 minus 1 is 9. Giving us, finally, how many marks did I get for this? Uh, 8 plus 3, 9 over 3, right? I got 4 marks. Okay, so it wasn't too difficult, but it, it is a bit long. I'll give you that. Okay. Whew. So I have done part A. It now says f of x equals 1 plus 11x minus 6x squared. Um, okay, over x minus 3, 1 minus 2x. So it's the same function as before, isn't it? But it's just defined for x being greater than 3. And we want to prove that f of x is decreasing. Okay. So decreasing, what's that talking about? It's talking about the direction in which it's going. So what's useful for that is the gradient. If I have a function and its gradient is negative, it means the function's going down. Positive gradient is going up. Negative gradient is going down. So I've got this function. How am I going to get its gradient? Well, I'm going to differentiate, aren't I? So let's do that first. Okay, I could look at this and differentiate the whole thing using the quotient rule, but I'll give you a hint, that's going to be horrible. Very, very grim. But look what we've done in part A. We've just spent all that effort and four marks getting it in this nice form. It's A plus B plus C plus B over this plus C over this. Each one of those terms is much easier to differentiate, isn't it? So let's work out, well, let's, you know what? Let's first of all write it with my B and my C. So. It's going to be the following. f of x is going to equal a, which is 3, and then the value of b was 4, so it's going to be plus 4. Now, this is over x minus 3, but I'm going to write this as x minus 3 to the minus 1, and that will come in useful when we differentiate. Similar thing with c. So what is the value of c? It's minus 2, so minus 2. And then instead of over 1 minus 2x, I'm just going to say 1 minus 2x to the minus 1 here. Okay, we're now at a pretty good point, aren't we? This is relatively simple to differentiate. So the derivative of f is going to equal. This just goes to nothing. What's this going to go to? So this x minus 3, it's a linear transformation on x. So essentially, I'm using the chain rule, right? I need to differentiate the inside bit, but the derivative of the inside bit is 1. So I just need to now treat this as if it's an x. So bring, one to the, bring the power to the front, so minus 4, and then take 1 away from the power. So over x minus 3 to the minus two. So what happens here? Chain, so I've got this minus two, and now I need to use the chain rule. So I need to differentiate the inner function. So I differentiate that and I get minus two. I now need to bring the power down so I get minus one. And then, so there's a lot of bits here, I need to take one from the power. Ooh, bit grim. Let's see what we can do with this. So this is gonna be minus four over x minus three squared minus 2 times minus 2 is going to be positive 4 times by minus 1 is going to be negative 4 and then this thing here is going to be over 1 minus 2x all squared Whew. okay so this is the derivative here now let's look at each one of these terms i've got minus 4 and then divided by some square number and then i've got so the thing is, a square number always has to be positive, doesn't it? So if I have a negative number divided by a positive number, that's always going to be negative. And then I'm minusing another thing. Hey, look, 4 divided by, again, this is a square number. So it doesn't matter what x is, this thing's always going to be positive. So I've got a negative number minus a positive number, essentially. So no matter what x is, this thing is always going to be less than 0. Therefore, the function is decreasing. So we would also have to be slightly careful because you could say to yourself, wait a minute, there might be a couple of points here that stuff goes badly. The function might not be continuous. For example, if x is three, then this 
bottom is going to go to zero and this derivative is going to blow up and weird things and math errors are going to happen. Similarly, if x is equal to a half here, this, de this denominator is going to go to zero. Bad and crazy things are going to happen. But if you look, we're told that x is greater than three. So in other words, we know that x can't be equal to three or a half. So we know that at this point, we've just got this continuous part. Nothing crazy is happening and the derivative is always going to be less than zero. Question 12, and it looks like we've got more trig again. Okay, right, let's see what we've got. So prove that. One minus cos of two theta is the same as tan theta times sine of two theta. A few ways to do this. I'm going to develop the left-hand side, I reckon. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, instead of writing cos of two theta, it's the same as cos squared minus sine squared, essentially. You get that from the multiple angle formula. So what I'm now going to do is I want to get this just in terms of sine. So I'm going to swap cos here for one minus sine squared. So this cos is going for one minus sine, still got this other sine squared here. And then I'm gonna show you kind of what I mean by this. So this is gonna be one minus one minus two sine squared theta. The ones are gonna cancel, this two is gonna become positive. So that's gonna be two sine squared theta. All right, I'm gonna show you something cheeky here. Right, so if you look at it, we want a tan theta and we want a sine of two theta, but we've just got two sines squared. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to split this sine squared up into two sine and then, and then another sine, okay? Why am I doing this? Because one of them I'm going to use for the tan and the other one I'm going to use for the sine of two theta. So sine of two theta is two sine theta cos theta. And tan of theta is sine theta over cos theta. So if you look here, what this two sine, I can use that as a part of this sine of two theta. And then this other sine I can use as a part of this sine theta over cos theta. So look at how I'm going to do this. I'm going to, I'm going to times and divide by cos simultaneously. It's a cheeky one, but you'll like it. So in, instead, this thing here, I'm going to write the following. Two sine theta cos theta, okay, so a times by cos, so I need to outdo that. So then this bit times by sine theta divided by cos theta. So look what I've done. This is completely allowed. I have not changed the value of this at all. I've times it by something, but then divided by that thing. But look at this now. This is exactly sine of two theta, and this is exactly tan of theta. I know, I know, I know, horrible. So that's part A done. Okay, part B. Ooh, okay, that looks pretty horrible. So I've got a hen, so I'm, going, I'm using part A. I'm using part A, right? So sex squared minus five times one minus cos of two x is the same as three tan squared sine two x. Okay, well, how can we use part A? Look at that second bracket on the left-hand side. One minus cos of two x. Well, we've just shown what one minus cos of two theta is. It's going to work with one minus cos two x as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite this, but swapping out that second bracket to what we've just shown. So that's the same. But now instead of writing one minus cos of two x, I'm going to write tan x sine of two x. And all of that is equal to three tan squared x sine of two x. Okay, quite a lot going on here. I can cancel some stuff, but we need to be careful. So I can cancel the tan out. I can also cancel the sine of 2x out, but I can't cancel them out without acknowledging the fact that these things equaling zero could be a solution of this equation. So tan x equals zero definitely solves this equation because the left-hand side would be zero and the right-hand side would be zero. And the same with sine of 2x. So here's what I can do. I can say either tan x equals zero, or, and then that gives me the, the pass to divide by sine x, to, by tan x, sorry. And then I'm going to do the same with sine of 2x equals zero, or, and then that also gives me the pass to divide by sine of 2x. So now I can divide by both of these things because I've not lost the fact that they could also equal zero. So what's the equation that would result from this? I would get sex squared minus five, this is gone at this point, equals three, I've still got one tan left, 
and then the sine's gone as well. Okay, so I've kind of got three equations here. So let's, let's first of all just get the solutions from this out the way, okay? So x is between minus pi by 2 and pi by 2. Now, luckily, the only solution here that I'm going to get from this is 0. So essentially, I'm going to get 0 from sine because sine hits at 0. I'm not going to draw the graph out here, but you need to know that. Same with tan hits at 0. Now, the next point tan hits is at pi, but that's out my range. Similar with sine. For sine of 2x, the range is going to be between minus pi and pi. And it does hit at pi, but look, it, it doesn't say equal to pi. It's just a less than. So essentially, all of the this thing here is just going to lead me to the solution x equals 0 in both cases. Okay, so I get x equals 0 or whatever this equation is. Fantastic. So what can I do here? I've kind of got something quadratic, but I've got a set squared and I need it in terms of tan, don't I? But luckily, this is an identity. So sex squared is the same as tan squared plus 1. So I would get the following. Tan squared x plus 1 minus 5 equals 3 tan x. This is good because, yeah, it's quadratic and a bit horrible, but the only trig function I have here is tan. So this is solvable. Get it all onto one side, okay? So tan squared minus 3 tan x minus 4 is equal to 0. Can I factorize this? I think I... Can. So I'm going to get tan x and tan x. What is going to add together to make minus 3 and times together to make minus 4? Positive 1 and negative 4. So this is going to lead me to two solutions for tan x. I'm going to get tan x either equals minus 1 or 4. We're getting there. We're getting there. So essentially at this point, I'm probably only really going to have one solution for each one of these things. Let's just see what I get. So the inverse tan of minus 1, making sure that my calculator is in radians this time. So let's do that before anything. Angle unit radians. So the inverse tan of minus 1 is going to get me minus pi by 4. So this is going to lead me to x equals minus pi by 4. That's nicely in range, isn't it? And then the inverse tan of 4 is going to get me what? That is going to get me 1.3 to five, three decimal places where appropriate. So I'm going to be 1.326. And that is within the range because, you know, pi by two is around 1.5. So this is just below that. And I reckon that is all of my solutions. Whew. Whew. So question 13 looks pretty grim, doesn't it? So it's just 10 markers straight in. So let's have a look at it. Figure two which is a sketch of a part of a curve C with equation Y equals X lin X. Line L is the normal to the C, to, to the C, to C at point P, E, E. Region R um, is bounded by the curve C, the line L on the X axis. Find the area of R, essentially. We want to show that it is A squared plus B, where A and B are rational numbers to be found. Okay. Um, the first thing I want to do is kind of go high level and look at, you know, how we are really going to get this area. So let's get the graph up here. What is this area going to be? What is it comprised of? So a lot of the time you're going to get, you're going to have to do some kind of integral, so a curved bit. But then a lot of the time you do get nice shapes happening as well. So if I was to draw a line here, all of this to the right of this line is just a pretty nice triangle, isn't it? And then this bit here, you know, between these two points is curved, so I'm going to need to integrate. So essentially it's going to be made of two things. Area one which is going to be the integral between here and here of this curve. And then area two, it's going to be a pretty nice triangle, isn't it? So let's start with two. Let's start with the easy one. Essentially, that's a triangle. So I'm going to need the height of it and the base of it. I have the height of it. The height of it is E because I know that the Y coordinate of P is E. So I've got E coming up this way. All I now need really is the base. So what am I going to need to get this base? Well, I know that the x-coordinate of this thing here is e. So if I get the x-coordinate of where this normal meets the x-axis, I'll be able to work out the length of that there. So to find where the normal hits the x-axis, I'm probably going to need the equation of the normal. You're kind of seeing why we're going to need 10 marks for this. Because to get the equation of the normal, what I'm going to need to do is differentiate this curve to get its gradient. And then I'm going to need to do loads of other stuff, <laughs> but, but, but let's start with that, okay? So let's differentiate this curve. 
before anything. So dy by dx, I'm going to need to use the product rule here. So it's x times ln x. So I'm going to write down the x, differentiate the ln x, plus differentiate the x, 1 times write down the ln x. So it's going to be 1 plus ln x. What I now want to do is substitute the x coordinate of this point in here, which is e. So I'm going to say at p dy by dx or m or whatever. Let's go dy by dx here and then use m for the normal. dy by dx is going to equal 1 plus ln of e. What is ln of e? Well, it's the power I need to raise e to to get e, which is 1. So this is going to be 2. So that would be the gradient of the tangent at that point P, but we care about the normal, don't we? Meaning that my M for the normal is going to be the negative reciprocal of that, so minus a half. So I've now actually got enough information to get the equation of this normal. So I'm going to use Y minus Y1 is equal to M X minus X1 here. And I have everything because I know that it goes through the point E, E, and I know that its gradient is minus a half. So just sub them in Y minus E equals minus a half times by x minus e. Oh, quite a lot going on. Now, I could rearrange this, but why don't I just straight away say, well, the only, the only reason I really care about this equation is to get where it hits the x-axis. So why don't I straight away just set y equals zero and then work out that value of x. So, so let's just say y equals zero gives me what? So it's going to get me minus e equals minus a half times x minus e. So let's times through by minus two here. So I'm gonna get two e equals, and then one times x minus e. So in other words, x minus e. Add the e, I know there's a lot, I know there's a lot. So it's two e plus e, which is three e. So the x coordinate of where this normal hits is at three e. But if we were to look at kind of our triangle or our diagram here, this is at 3e, but then this is at e, so the difference between them is 2e, meaning that the area of this triangle here is going to be, you know, so the area of 2, essentially, is going to be a half base times height. So the area of 2 is going to be a half times the base, which is 2e, times the height, which is e. So these 2s are going to cancel, and I'm just going to get e squared. Okay. That's the easy bit. That is genuinely the easy bit because that's the triangle. And now I need to look at this thing and look at the, um, the integral, essentially. Okay, so I have the upper limit of this integral. It's going to be E. What's the lower limit? Well, the lower limit is going to occur when this curve hits the x-axis. So I need, to, I need to find out where this curve is going to hit the x-axis before going on. And then I'm going to do this integral. So the curve y equals x ln x hits the x-axis when y is equal to zero. So that is going to get me either x equals zero or ln x equals zero. Now looking at the diagram, we can see that x does equal zero because that's the origin. But the one I care about is when ln x equals zero. But when is ln x equal to zero? Well, that is going to be when x equals e to the zero, which is one. Okay, so I've got a lower limit. Lower limit is going to be one. Upper limit is going to be e, and <laughs> I've still got the integral to do that, haven't I? So 1e, and I need to integrate x ln x. <sighs> How do I integrate this? I'm actually going to need to use parts here, because I've got two integrals, I've got two functions times together. So essentially, we, we, need, to, we need to differentiate one and integrate the other. So. This is going to be in your formula book club. I'm going to do it relatively quickly here. Essentially, I'm going to want to actually integrate the x. This is the one case where I want to integrate up x's and differentiate the ln because I don't really have an easy integral for ln. So the integral of the x is going to be x squared over 2. The derivative of the ln is going to be 1 over x. So then this is going to get me the following. The undifferentiated version of this one, so it's going to be x times by the integrated, ver I apologize, the one different, the one of, of differentiating, so it's gonna be ln x, times by the integrated version, which is gonna be x squared over two, minus the integral, and then the differentiated version, so this one over x, 
times by the integrated version. I've gone through that quickly, but look at your formula booklet to really, um, you know, get a better grip of that. Because I am, I am aware of how long this question's getting. So I just want to kind of go through a bit quickly. So essentially, I'm going to get x squared over 2 lin x. But I've still got another integral to do, but before I do it, I'm going to simplify a bit. So what I'm going to get, I'm going to cancel these x's and bring this half outside. So it's going to be minus half times the integral of x. Okay, so this is going to be x squared over 2 ln x minus half, and then I'm going to add on to the power here, and then divide by the new power. So I'm going to get that. Okay, now I'm not writing a plus c because this is actually a definite integral. I'm going to put these square brackets on now. So I'm going to get x squared over 2 times by ln x, and then minus these twos are going to go together. So that's going to be x squared over 4, and then this is all between the limits of e and 1. Okay. One bracket is going to be me subbing in e, and then the second bracket is going to be me subbing in the 1. So you're from the lower limit. So, so just go straight in, okay? So it's going to be e squared over 2 times ln e minus e squared over 4, and then minus 1 squared over 2 is a half, ln of 1, and then minus 1, 1 squared over 4. Okay, we're getting there. What do we have? So ln e is 1, which is nice. So I get e squared over 2 minus e squared over 4. Ln of 1 is 0, so this goes, so I'm just left with minus minus a quarter, which is plus a quarter. e squared over 2 minus e squared over 4 is going to be a quarter e squared. So this gets me a quarter e squared plus a quarter, but remember, I need to add it to the area I derived earlier, which gets me e squared. So, Adding all of this together, I hope I get the right answer. I'm going to get a quarter e squared plus a quarter plus e squared. So my e squareds, I'm going to put them together to get five over four of them. And then plus a quarter. Now, that is at least in the form that they want. So I'm going to hope that's the right answer. So essentially, A is going to equal five over four here, a rational number. And B is going to equal a quarter, also a rational number. Whew. All right, last question. Let's see if we can smash it. So, a scientist is studying the population of mice on an island. The number of mice n in the population t months after the start of the study is modeled by the equation this. n equals 900 over 3 plus 7e to the minus 0.25t. Pretty grim equation, but we're all right. And the number of mice at the start of the study. Okay, cheeky mark. Not too bad here because at the start of the study, t is 0. Okay, so why don't we just call it, I don't know, n naught for n for when t equals 0. Just going to equal 900 over 3 plus 7 and then e to the 0. e to the 0 is just 1. So this is going to be 900 over 10, which is 90. First mark, not too bad. Part B. Show that the rate of growth, dn by dt, okay, so we want dn by dt here, the derivative, is given by dn by dt equals n. Ooh, okay, so n 300 minus n over 1200. Yeah, you're not going to like this one. This isn't going to be that nice. The reason is we're going to differentiate this. We're going to get it in terms of t though, aren't we? And then I assume we're going to have to do some pretty interesting algebra to actually kind of reverse engineer this back into something as a function of n. So I would have guessed that not many students got this. So don't worry if this is probably going to look a bit hard. I don't even know how good this is going to get. I just have a feeling. Okay, so let's just differentiate first of all. So I'm going to, let's write n actually first. I'm just going to bring this bottom to the top as a power of minus 1. So this is going to be 900 times by 3 plus 7e to the minus 0.25t, all to the power of minus 1. That means we can use the chain rule here. Okay, so I'm just going to keep this 900 out here. And then the chain rule says that I differentiate the inside first. So differentiating the inside, I get what? I get minus 0.25 from this times by 7 times by this e to the minus 0.25t, okay? I'm now going to treat this as if it's just my variable. So I'm going to bring minus 1 to the, you know, the power to the front. I'm then going to take 1 away from the power. So it's going to be times by 3 plus 7e to the minus 0.25t. It's massive, all to the minus 2. Wow. Okay, let's see what we can do here. 
few things happening. First of all, this is a power of the minus two. So what I'm actually gonna wanna do is put it on the bottom. So this is just the same as three plus seven e to the minus 0.25t all squared on the bottom. Got a negative here and a negative here. So they're gonna cancel, leaving me with 900 times by seven and then times by Let's put it in as a quarter, I prefer fractions. So this is gonna be a quarter and then e to the minus 0.25t. And I think that's everything. Okay, so that's it in terms of t, but that's not what they want, is it? So, okay, gonna be a couple of difficult things going on here. The first thing that I think I wanna do is, you know what, before anything, this quarter here, it's annoying me. So what I'm gonna do is just bring that four down here instead. So that's gonna kind of go, but then I'm gonna have a four here. It just makes it a bit easy. I've not got this double fraction going on. Now, each little bit here can is almost n, so can be expressed in terms of n. For example, three plus seven e to the minus 0.25t. Look at the definition of n. That's what's on the bottom of it. Meaning that if I have, let's show you, let's, let's show you in a different color, okay? So I have n, equals 900 over three plus seven e to the minus 0.25t. Why don't I rearrange this thing then for n? So I'm gonna times through by this whole denominator. And then I'm gonna divide through by n to get this thing is equal to 900 over n. So that's good because I can inject this straight in here, can't I? So I'm gonna do a similar thing with this as well now I'm here. So essentially, I have this 7e to the minus 0.25t here. I'm gonna work out that as well. So 7e to the minus 0.25t is just gonna equal 900 over n minus this three. So I'm gonna sub both of these into this fraction and then I'm gonna see what comes out of it. So, okay, just be super careful here because it's probably gonna be quite easy to make mistakes. You might witness me making one now. So I've got 900 times by 7e to the minus 0.25t, which is this. So this is 900 over n minus three. I hope I do the right thing here. And then divided by four times by three plus 7e to the minus 0.25t, which is this. So 900 over n, and then all of that is squared. Okay, so maybe we're gonna see this thing turning out nice here. Let's square this thing out. So I'm gonna get 900 times 900 over n minus three over four times 900 squared over n squared. Okay, this is good. First thing I can do is I've got a 900 here, which I can cancel with a squared here. And then this n squared, I've got like divided by, divided by n squared. So I'm gonna get this and essentially put it to the top of the fraction here. So what's gonna happen is the following. One of the 900 is gone and this n squared comes up to the top. So I get n squared times by 900 over n minus three. And then what's left on the bottom, the 900, one of the 900s is gone and the n squared is gone. So in other words, I'm gonna get four times by 900. <laughs> okay, so we're kind of getting there, I hope. So why don't I multiply this thing out on the top and see what I've got? So I've got n squared times by 900 over n. One of the n's are gonna cancel. So I get 900 n and then minus three n squared. All of this is over four times 900. Okay, what do I wanna cancel out now? So, you can see here that they have an n factorized out on the top, and that is something that I can do. So that's gonna get me closer to what I want. So this is gonna be what, 900 minus three n on the top, and I seem to be getting there. But they only have, inside their bracket, they have 300 minus n, but I have 900 minus three n. So it looks like in my top bracket, I've got three times what they want. But that's good because I can divide both top and bottom of this whole fraction by three here. So dividing the top by three, I can just divide this inner bracket by three, getting me 300 minus n. And then dividing this by three, well 900, you know, is a multiple of three. So I can divide that. So that's gonna be four times. And if I divide 900 by three, I'm gonna be left with 300. 
So I really hope this is the answer, but I'm going to get N times 300 minus N divided by 1200, which is the answer. Horrible question. Don't worry if you just saw me do that and you're thinking, what? I would have expected, you know, many people to struggle on this, so don't worry too much. Okay, show, now I've done that bit. The rate of growth is a maximum after T months. Find according to the model, the value of T. Okay, so we've done all of this work to get the derivative in terms of N. And that's because the form of this is actually quite nice. So I believe that um, it's just going to be a case of, you know, finding out essentially what the maximum value of N should be. And then, you know, given this. So essentially, if I've got this n and then times 300 minus n, okay, I'm not going to do this whole thing, but essentially 300n and then minus n squared. If I was to almost complete the square on this, what is that? What's that value of n? Essentially, I'm not going to do the whole completing the square, but what I will, what we are sure to have is half of the coefficient of this n. So that's going to be n equals 150. So that is going to be the value of n that maximizes this thing. So essentially, it's then a case of like, well, how do we get t from that? So just looking at the question here, I suppose the question is kind of which is the equation that's going to you know, make this nicest. And I reckon, given that we have an n value, it's going to be the initial one. OK, so it's going to be 150. It's just going to be equal to, you know, my thing here, and I'm just going to rearrange for t. So e to the minus 0.25t. Okay, to get t on its own, I'm going to want to first of all times up by all of this stuff. So 3 plus 7e to the minus 0.25t. While I'm here, I might as well do 900 divided by 150 to get me 6. So now we're not too bad. I'm going to take this 3 away. So 7e to the minus 0.25t equals 6, to, 6 take away 3, apologies, which is 3. Then divide by the 7, so e to the minus 0.25t equals 3 over 7. At this point, I can do a loop because that's how, you know, the inverse of e. So that's going to be minus 0.25t equals ln of 3 over 7. We're getting there because t is now going to equal minus 1 over 0.25 ln of 3 over 7. Only go to the calculator right at the end, and that is going to get us what? minus 1 over 0.25 times the natural log 3 over 7, which is going to get me, what, about 3.389 dot, dot, dot. Uh, find according to the model, you know, the value of t. So let's, I don't know, do that to two significant figures. So t is going to equal, what, 3.39. Whew, pretty horrible. So... What is the last bit? We only have one mark to go at the end, which is nice. So state the value of P. Okay, the maximum number of mice on the island is P, state the value of P. Well, essentially, how are we going? To, so, so we know what N is equal to, okay? So then it's just the case of thinking, how is this, you know, what is the way that we're going to get this to be the maximum? Look at, look at what n, how n reacts to t, essentially. I've got 900 divided by 3 plus, and then 7e, and then this thing is negative. This is a negative exponential here. This is on the bottom, okay? So if I divide by a bigger number, that's going to make my n smaller. So I essentially want to minimize the bottom, don't I? And how am I going to do that? What happens as t goes to infinity? e is going to go all the way to zero, isn't it? Because it's a negative exponential. And I want to minimize that, don't I? Because it's on the bottom and I want to divide by the lowest number possible. So, in other words, n, as t goes to infinity, is going to tend to what? It's going to be 900 over 3 plus 7 kind of times zero, isn't it? So what's this going to be? It's going to be 900 divided by 3 which is 300 there. Um, so then it's one of them, because it, you could either say, because it tends to 300, it's never quite going to hit it, so you could maybe say that the maximum is 299, but 300 would be totally acceptable here as well. So 300 is going to be my value of P.